I want to share a word which I believe is one of the most important messages that I've ever preached. And I really strongly encourage you to check it out and listen to the whole thing. And I pray that it would impact you, inspire, provoke, and edify you in the precious name of Jesus. I'm going to share insight from Leonard Ravenhill because I believe that his quotes will help clarify and amplify what I believe the Lord is trying to say to his church in this hour. This is really the foundational message of Pure Art Ministries. And I believe it's such a now word because of what's happening. As we look around, we see a world that's declining uh, morally and in many ways. It is becoming a more anti-Christian world. And it's time for the church to awaken. It's time for the church to arise and shine. There is an alarm from heaven that for so long we've been pressing the snooze button, but God says it's all over. You either get up and wake up now or you miss it. We are honored to be privileged, anointed, and appointed to be living at such a time as this. These are difficult, perilous times, but for us in Christ that are found in the secret place, they should be exciting times, that you are going to be called to do something wonderful and powerful in this time. But we've got to be changed. And so I want to share a message, and I just pray, Father God, that you would speak through me. Holy Spirit, move on the hearts. Open eyes to see, ears to hear, so that we receive revelation of the Word, that it impacts, transforms, changes us. And I thank you, Father God, that in the midst of this, we would hear what the Spirit has to say to the church, receive it, and be changed by it. That you be glorified, Jesus lifted up, and all men drawn unto Jesus. We thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And I want to start by quoting from Joel chapter 2, if I may. And in verse 1 it says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. And it's explaining that the day of the Lord is near. It's close at hand. And that's the hour that we live in, where the return of Jesus is clearly very soon. Now, I don't know weeks, days, years. I don't know if you'll come back in this generation. But I see things going on, on the earth. And I could spend a lot of time going through signs that should totally, completely disturb the church. That if God doesn't move, the danger of the future for humanity. When we look back at things that caused God to judge in the past, then how can we not think that God will not judge in the future based on what's happening on the earth today? But what's the role of the church? Well, as I look in Joel chapter 2, verse 12, um, it says this, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. And I love that because yet even now, no matter how dark or how difficult it looks, there's always a yet even now. Because we have a bigger God and small devil. Further, we have a defeated devil who's trying to make himself big. He's trying to attack certain things, including the authority and final authority of the Word. We need to cry out for revival. Why? Because revival is a divine assault on society. That changes everything. When I look at the revivals of the past, and you can look at some of my videos, and I will record some more. In a revival, everything changes. For example, many of us are crying out for justice. Maybe you've been hurt, injured by somebody in the past. And we want justice, and we try in every way to persuade them of the wrong that they did us. And no matter how hard we try, they never receive it. But in a revival, all of a sudden, people are so stirred by the Spirit that there's a rest restoration and restitution. We see everything change, including morally, spiritually. We see crime rates drop. And then we see the benefits and blessings of revival, which impacts socially, economically, and in other ways. As we look at this generation, which has been swept into hell, Something's got to happen within the church that we see what's really happening from the Father's perspective. Back in 1987, I was called into ministry. I was actually trying to go and be a doctor, and the Lord stopped me. In 1989, when I had graduated university, um, the Lord came back and says, I called you to preach, and He gave me Joel chapter 2 as a foundational message. Before that, of course, I had thought of preaching. I wanted to preach on the love message. I had all my intentions that I was going to be an expert on the love message. That was not what God's plan was. 
I had many names for the ministry. I had drawn up logos, logos for it. But the Lord turned up and said, you'll call it Pure Heart. And I'm like, no, Lord, I don't like the name Pure Heart. In fact, many times I've tried to change it because I didn't have the full revelation of what he was looking for. But I understand now as he's been sharing with me that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. They'll have that personal revelation, that personal revival. And we need that more than ever. You need to have such a firm foundation that you know him and that you're more conscious of his presence day after day. That's why we need the secret place. And I'm spending so much time on the secret place because I so desperately want you to understand, appreciate how you need to dwell permanently in the secret place in this hour. It's an hour of great deception. And if we do not hear what the Spirit is saying, if we do not hear the Word and we do not stay abiding in the Word, there is a danger that this deception will deceive even the elect. I don't want to miss it. I want to be in the right place. I want to be occupying till He comes. As I continued, the Lord Torrent says, for example, the Hebrides Revival. They had been praying and seeking the Lord, doing all the right things, having regular prayer meetings, but they weren't seeing the revival. And we need to look and, and have that self-examination, as I'll explain. They suddenly understood the importance that who can ascend the hill of the Lord except he who is a clean hand and a pure heart. There's something about purity of the heart, being cleansed before the Lord. And then finally, the Lord Trent said, the goal of your instruction is to be loved from a pure heart. And I pray that even this message would come forth with such a purity and just dripping and oozing with the love of the Father. That in all things, in all ways, that you're drawn closer to Him and getting a better understanding of His love for you and for mankind. Now, I want to share something from Leonard Ravenhill. And he said, prayer is taxing. Prayer is exacting. Prayer means enduring. Prayer means denying self, a daily dying by choice. And that's the secret place. I looked at the book of Revelation, and in chapter 3, we see the church of Philadelphia. And God says to them, you know, you are lacking in power. And I'm thinking, how can they be lacking in power if we have the same Holy Spirit? If the same Holy Spirit that came forth on the day of Pentecost, who moved in that generation and has moved in many generations since in mighty power, then how can we try and say that we lack power? As I looked at it, something Leonard Ravenel also said is that prayerlessness is powerlessness and that our prayer life, our time spent in the secret place is critical. Whereas we seek His face and cry out to Him, it will build you up. I don't know what storms lie ahead for tomorrow. I don't know what shakings are coming. And if we think that we're secure, I think of Esther. And Esther was comfortable because she was queen. And many of us are in a place where we're comfortable and all is good and well. But the warning that came to Esther, if you do not act, if you do not recognize that you're called for such a time as this and do the purpose of heaven, God will find somebody else. But the consequence and we got to understand there's the reality of heaven, the reality of hell, and there's the reality of consequences. And if we think that just because we're comfortable right now, that a storm won't come tomorrow to us, to our family, to our cities, that things can change overnight, we're fooling ourselves. And you need to have a prayer life where you have a rich, intimate, deep fellowship with the Lord. So that when the storms come, you rest secure in Him on His Word, and have the peace and joy that He gives, a peace the world cannot understand. That place of assurity that you know that your God is for you, and that no matter what happens, you are unshakable in everything. We need that. Now, Leonard Ravenel went on to say this because he quoted from a famous scripture where it says that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all that we dare ask, think, or imagine. And we like scriptures like that because they inspire us. And many people like to preach inspiring messages, but they won't, don't preach the full context. And then a raven will explain this. It is wrong when instead of praying... Sorry, let me go back here. Um, let me get the right verse here. God is able, without a doubt, to do all that the first part of this verse implies. But read on. The promise is that God is able according to the power that works in us. And so there has to be something going on inside of us that we come to the place that we're strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might. So that precious promise, as we abide in the secret place, becomes ours. The blessings and promises of Psalm 91 become ours as we abide in the secret place. Like David in 20, Psalm 27, in the day of trouble, I am concealed in the secret place. That place of relationship where I come under the authority of the uh, Lord God Almighty, under his wings. He went on to say this, It is wrong when instead of praying, we do things that just please others. There cannot be two operators of the Christian life. We are either spirit-led in everything or self-led. And if we continue on the path where we're self-led, living life where we're enjoying it, and that God's not against you enjoying it, God wants you to enjoy it, but we're consumed with the pleasures of life and not the pursuit of Him. We're not going after Him, and we're not spending more and more time daily after Him. And church leaders are not stepping up to the plate and preaching the gospel to so stir you to develop a dependence upon Him in your life. That you need, you need a dependence on Jesus in this hour. He went on to say this, We may call prayerlessness neglect, or lack of spiritual appetite, or loss of vision, but that which matters is what God calls it. In 1 Samuel 12, 23, God calls prayerlessness sin. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. And we've got to understand that we're walking in a place outside of His will when we don't have a fervent, deep prayer life. You need it. God created prayer. And it's that place of fellowship with, you, with Him, which is what the secret place is all about. See, the secret place is where I'm real before God. It's not when I turn up the church and I'm praying, and a lot of us could put on an act. But see, I've seen many people put on the act, and they have all these things happen to them, but they're not having the deep change on the inside of them. And they're not getting into the secret place where it's real, and God is able to touch them and address the real issues in them. Prayerlessness is disobedience, for God's command is that men ought always to pray and faint not. To be prayerless is to fail God, for he says, Ask me. Prayerlessness is a sin. Now, as I look at those strong words, I hope they impact you, for that we need to be a people of prayer. And that through prayer, we birth on the earth the very purposes and will of the Father. That God is looking for those on the earth that will pray. I look at Zechariah chapter 1, where there are these beasts roaming the earth that bring back a report that all is quiet. And surely that report of all being quiet would have been such a good word that should have brought all is good. But the Lord was offended. Why? Because they were at ease. And when we look at the full context, we discover that the children of Israel had been in captivity 70 years. And God said, I'll send you in captivity for 70. Recognizing the 70 years had come to the end, the set time had come. That it was now time, as he would explain, to ask of him for the rain in its season, for God to move. And we need to recognize the time and the hour. We need to be like the sons of Ishakar, where we know the times, we discern it, and we know what to do. And part of that is prayer. Jesus was very clear regarding the last days, prayer. That you need to be prayerful, watchful, be alert, be sober, and be aware. How can I do that? By having a vibrant prayer life. Now, if I continue, I want to go back to something because um, we take scriptures, particularly in this hour, and we take the nice parts we like. But remember of the Passover lamb. They would eat the whole lamb, even the parts that offended them. Leonard Ravenel said, but we are not, sorry, but are we not also guilty of misquoting the royal message in our ideas? And we present a gospel according to our opinions, removing out of it the parts we don't like, the judgment, the reality of hell and the reality that Jesus is the only way. And unless we come back to the truth and preach that truth, how will this generation receive it, hear it, and be set free? He went on to say this, Since something is obviously stopping the Spirit's inflow to us Christians, the same thing is stopping this outflow from us. With the Spirit's help, we need to search for this hindrance, for God searches the heart. And we need, in that secret place, to humble ourselves and say, God, you need to search me. You need to look at every area of my life, and nothing is off limits. I come in this humility and surrender myself under your mighty hand that you would have such an access, such a work in me, that if there's anything that's offending, anything that's hindering, anything, because a lot of times there's stuff we hide. We hide very well in church. We hide. And we need to come into the secret place and they need to be addressed before they grow and develop into something and become an opening for the enemy in your life. 
See, I don't want to block the move of the Spirit. I want to block what God's doing in my life. I want to be such a blessing to others because I'm wrecked by His love and I want to have that love overflow from me so others can be touched. He went on to say this, Nothing seems to put a sagging prayer meeting back on its feet, like the promise in these verses. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also the servants and your handmaids in those days, I will pour my spirit. Let us consider this passage at great length. In these turbulent days, some men use this Joel 2 promise as a sheet anchor for the soul, or else they hold like a shining star of hope in the black sky of this moral midnight. But to isolate this text is unlawful, unscriptural, and therefore untrue. And we like that verse, I've heard it preached so many times, and I've preached it. But in the context that yet afterwards, there's something that has to occur before. And God is right now ready to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh if the church will meet the requirements. And that's the part we don't like to preach on, the conditions. That there are requirements, things that God is looking for on the earth just like in the time of Zechariah. Where is there people disturbed? Where are there people that's getting the voice of the Spirit, hearing the wake-up call, and coming and rising and shining and saying, God, I am moved and, gen- and because of what I see going on in this generation, I am broken for it, and I refuse to allow this generation to be swept into hell. I will do everything in my power. I give my all to you because I desire to see this generation touched. He went on to say, Leonard Ravenhill, of all these promises, this promise of revival to come in those days is obviously conditional. He went on, and he also said this, I like this, an old Chinese proverb says that he who would take a thousand steps must take the first one. By the same token, he would claim Joel 2, 28 and 29, must start early in the chapter. Verse 12 would be a good starting point. Therefore says the Lord, turn, turn you to me with all your heart, Uh, with fasting, with mourning, and with weeping. So there has to be us receiving the condition. And in the secret place, we come to the place where we humble ourselves, and there's a breaking of us. There's a changing of us. There has to be, right now, a turning where He becomes our all in all, that we recognize the hour and the lateness. If you could go forth in a time machine and see, you know, in a few months, few years, wherever it may be, the Lord returning, it would change your perspective on life. If you could see in another month what was going to befall even yourself, it would change how you act today. And God is speaking to the church and saying, listen, this is what's coming, arise and shine. Listen, He's speaking boldly and clearly to the church, the signs that are accelerating. We need to hear them and listen to what the Spirit is saying and begin to comply. In, oh goodness, goodness. He went on to say, revival must not just be a once a week concern in the midweek church prayer meeting. So if you really are broken for revival, then it becomes more. I look at Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was a man that at the age of 13 started to get a hunger for revival. He read the stories of the revivals of past and of the great heroes of faith, and it stirred in him something. He recalled how they saw 100,000 won from the Lord in 1859. And inside of him, he began to claim that, saying, God, if you did it in the past generation, you can do it in ours. Well, it didn't look like it. But Evan Roberts, who was a nobody in the middle of the mines, not the person that you would think from the natural perspective that God would use. How could He use this person? How could He birth a revival through a nobody who did not have no great network, didn't have any great name, his family were nobodies. But he was a man desperate after God, a man who was kicked out of his apartment. You know why? Because he prayed too much and he prayed too loud and it scared the landlady. How many of us have been kicked out of somewhere because we pray too loud? And his seminary was working, you know, uh, in Bible school, his fellow students were disturbed because all night he would just be grumbling and praying. He'd be walking down the street and he'd be caught up into a trance seeking the Lord. How many of us are that far gone that God, my life is now built around you. My heart is set that God, what you desire on the earth, I have agreed with and I'm going after. My priority today is to see your purpose, your will on the earth because I know it goes beyond me. And the enemy wants you focused on you, on that initial need that you have, that initial want that you have. And that's what he did with Adam and Eve. That's how they fell. Just taste of the fruit. And what we've got to understand is the bigger picture and the call to have dominion on the earth and to walk and to see him glorified. Now, 
He went on to say this, um, here then are the ingredients of the first phase of our quest for an outpoured blessing. Turn you even to me with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And how many of us are willing to come back to the Lord with fasting, weeping, and mourning, where all of a sudden our appetite, our desire is focused on Him. I have liked to watch very little TV, but certain shows I watch occasionally are forensic shows. And in it, I was watching how that they can tell whether or not when you are crying, it's real. Because when it's real, you know, even your nose cries. I mean, I'm not trying to be gross. But every part of your being cries. It's broken. Because that something, it's hit your heart. And you can put on a fake show. And many of us have been putting on a fake show, believing if I fake it long enough, I'll make it. And we turn up the church and we put on the act of church. But behind the scenes, we're walking like the world. And God says, enough is enough. And God, rich in mercy, is saying to the church right now, waking up. I'm coming back for church without spot or wrinkle. And it's time that my church woke up and walked in the authority that it was called to do and fulfilled the purpose that we're designed to do. In Genesis um, 37, 29, when Reuben returned and Joseph was not in the pit, and this is the story, of course, where they put Joseph in the pit, his brothers, and uh, the sell him into slavery, okay? And, and Reuben returned and saw that he was not in the pit. Reuben rent his clothes. This rendering of the garments was again an outward sign of inward grief, a sign of a broken heart. And again, we discover from Joel 2.13, rend your hearts and not your garments and i like that because there's a rending of the natural heart where we're broken naturally it hurts us but there's a spiritual rendering where something we get a hold in our heart the very thing that breaks daddy god's heart and it becomes bigger greater it impacts you and it now influences you from that day on you live differently you now live for that purpose because it's in you it is written on your heart that law, that thing that God is so moved by, and out of such a love for the Father, a desperation that, God, I just so love you. I am broken by what breaks you, and I now pray differently. I'm not praying religiously. I'm tired of religious prayer meetings for revival. But when we get a revival prayer meeting that comes out of a people broken by the heart, by the Holy Spirit, and begin to pray out that inspiration, moved by the Spirit of God. There's a power in it. There's an authority in it, and it touches heaven, and we need that. Now, I'm going to do more shows or more uh, videos on this, so please stay tuned. In, let me go forward. The rendering of the garments could drift into hypocritical formality. Behind the outward observance, there could be no broken heart. And so it can be just a false show, or it can be a natural show, or it can go deeper and be something spiritual, something that changes me from the inside, because God is looking for an inside change, transformation, and a going after Him, a turning back, where I recognize the life that I've lived focused on the things of this world have failed me and brought me death. And I also understand more than that. That, God, I appreciate what's deep and on your heart, and that I'm called in this hour not to be self-focused, but to be God-focused on the purposes that you desire, that your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth, that you've called me, anointed me, great or small, to do something for your glory in this hour. He went on to say this, We rend our hearts by godly consideration and self-examination, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, by recognition of the failure to pray, by confessing that we, are more, we have a more appetite for material food than for spiritual. By acknowledging that we like the company of men more than the company of God. By abhorring ourselves because we love to play more than pray. And what's carried the greatest weight in your, value, in your life? What has most value to you? Is it God that, God, I've just got to get time with you. And if somebody was interviewing the people around you, what would they say about you? Would they say you are a person committed to prayer, that you go after God? Or are you a person that's nice to be around because you're just fun, you're in the world and everything else? What you read, what you look, what you play at is all world things. And you're not focused on God. Your life is not sanctified and separated, particularly in this hour. And I'm not trying to be judgmental or critical. I am trying that we get the balance correctly before the Lord. Um, he went on to say, our next instruction is a repeated one. Turn unto the Lord your God. They were admonished to turn to the Lord, so somewhere they had turned from Him. And we need to recognize, as the rebuke that came to the church of Laodicea, that they did not see that they were naked, wrecked, and in need. 
that we are naked, wretched, sorry, we're naked, wretched, and in need. Until we see our true state by the Spirit of God in the secret place where we're real. And I encourage you to check out the whole series on the secret place because you need to have a secret place dwelling now in this hour. That's your inheritance. And that's where God expects to find you. But it's a place of being real. And as long as we're playing a game, we're not abiding in the secret place. Are we like David, aware when we grieve the Spirit? Where do we begin to trust in the flesh, consciously or unconsciously? Where, because I think a lot of us have been fed on inspirational garbage that has been a sugar fix that hasn't got us from the inside and convicted us and changed us. Because God upholds all things by the word of His power. And the word of His power will uphold the whole of your life if you lean on it and trust on it. It will build you and change you. Amen? We must turn to God to receive compassion. Without Him, we have none for the multitudes. We must turn to Him for the power to pray. We must turn to Him for the power to endurance for fasting. We must turn to Him for vision. We must turn to Him for endurance to overcome principalities and power. You cannot overcome this. And we live in it now. We're trying to be good and do things in our ability. We are sinless. We're trying to overcome all these sins in our ability. And you can't. But in the secret place of exchange where you're real before God and God's real before you, there is an exchange. I put it on the altar and I say, God, this is who I, this is what I am. But I want to be changed that I'm now the new person in Christ and that I am being changed by your spirit and being built up by your word. Dan Stanley said, um, the harsh blast of the consecrated ram's horn called an assembly for an extraordinary fast. Not a soul was to be absent. So when that ram's horn went off, it was an alarm that demanded an immediate action. Not consideration. Not maybe. But it was to stir you that something dangerous, something incredible was at, uh, at hand and that you had to act. And we need to recognize the Spirit of God saying that this is the hour that we need to act. We need to hear Him. We need to obey Him and step up to the plate. In Judges 5, 2, that the leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered. And I love what Deborah said here, that the leaders led. And we need leaders that are leading in this hour, stepping up and demonstrating and living out this thing and not preaching inspirational garbage. We need to be stronger in the Lord. We need to get a hold of things. In Psalm 110, verse 3, your people volunteer freely in the day of your power. And we're in the day where God wants to move. But are we volunteering? Are we surrendering and yielding in the secret place? Say, God, you can use me and mean it. Not just sing the song in church services, but mean it. God, I put myself on the altar. And when I put myself on the altar, let the fire fall and consume the sacrifice. If I continue, if I get the page, hallelujah. In the time of calamity that Joel speaks of, the priests, the ministers of the Lord, were to weep between the porch and the altar. This is the divine arrangement. This is a divine commandment. This was not a suggestion, but the church, the leaders, and we are kings and priests, and we're called to weep between the porch and the altar, saying, save thy inheritance, because if you don't, we'll come under the dominion of the world. We lived in past generations where the church was persecuted here and there. And they could flee Jerusalem like Philip and go down to Samaria and they could see a revival. But in this hour, it's not just one nation or this place. It's a global persecution. And if we don't stand and arise, dominion comes over the church. And we have to bow to what the world says and not what the word says. Amen. So it's a time uh, that we must understand tears without prayers are vain. In the time of calamity, it might be right to say that prayers without tears are vain. Let us be a people that are real in the secret place and pray like we mean it. Press in like we mean it. So I pray that you're receiving this word. It's impacting you and changing you from the very inside by the Spirit of God. Hear the wake-up call. Be stirred. Be stirred in the name of Jesus. Understand that you're, there's so much at stake, more than you can imagine, not just your own life, your family, so many things, and we need to pray. Amen? Well, I pray this message has got you, blessed you, encouraged you. Please like, share, subscribe so we can see more people touched, standing, that the church arise. Amen? In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.